you can choose to believe that you have to follow a path that, you know, the people before you have created to get to where you want. And yeah, you'll probably succeed. But I think for me, following that path, it's just a no-no, right? Like I'm not going to leave my life up to someone else's hands, especially when those paths were created before we were even allowed to get on those paths. Like there's no way I'm going to follow that path. That path was never meant for me. I only have one life. And to me, I'm always going to bet on myself. 100% always going to bet on myself versus something that was carved out decades ago for everyone to follow. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. And today we have the final episode of season one of the Death Story series. You all really enjoyed this series and we're ending off the series with one of my favorite videos that I've ever made, which is an interview with Scott Moss. Scott Moss has one of the most interesting stories in this entire series. He went from dropping out of high school to having a successful career as a software developer, building two successful startups, and finally now working as a principal at a VC firm. He has honestly one of the most interesting stories and I really hope you enjoy this video. If you wanna see more content like this, make sure to tap that like button, smash that subscribe button, and let's get started with the video. I grew up in Atlanta with four brothers, three sisters, single mom. We moved to Atlanta and I just remember us living in like foster homes for a while until my mom got on her feet. And then eventually us just getting on our feet and we moved into like hotels. Um, I lived in a lot of hotels my whole life, like sleeping on floors and raiding the hotel kitchens for like cereal snacks at night and things like that. You know, we bounced around a lot because we moved from hotel to hotel. There was a lot of times we just didn't have food. We didn't know where the next meal was coming. So it was, it was pretty tough to just function as a kid would and just have fun when you just didn't know what you were going to eat next. And, you know, you're wearing the same dirty clothes for the you know, last three days or something like that. And my mom tried her best. Like, I, I don't say any of this to say that my mom is a bad parent. She's an amazing parents. She did what she could. She had eight children who were all really bad. Um, and she <laughs> did the best that she could. So yeah, my childhood was just full of hard lessons. And you know, I'm lucky to have survived it and, and lucky to have learned from it. When you were a kid, did you have like any like goals about what you wanted to be in the future? Like, was there a specific path you wanted to go towards? When I was a kid, like some of my biggest goals were very short sighted. It was just like, I just don't want to be poor. I just want to be able to afford to live somewhere where I wasn't evicted every 30 days. And I always had a fridge full of food and drinks. Like that was as far as my vision went when I became like 15 or 16 is or maybe even before, maybe like 13, 14 is so I started getting into sports, specifically basketball. And at that time, my sister was already super well known in basketball. She was like a phenom. So like everyone wanted me to be the same thing. So I kind of got into it. So I think maybe my goal is switch it over to like, I want to be a professional athlete, which, you know, is, is also very common in the places of poverty, especially black places of poverty, because that's kind of all the examples that we see. Uh, so I was like, yeah, I want to be an NBA player or NFL player or something like that. You know, I was tall. I was like six four at the age of like 14 or 15. So like, I was like, yeah, I could totally do this. That was it. Like that was my vision. That was the way out. And that's kind of all I I ever thought about it. I, I never thought that I'd get into tech or, or something crazy like that. I never even thought that I would even go to college unless it was for a basketball scholarship. So in high school, I legit didn't even think that like I was allowed to do tech. Like, I mean, at this point in my life, I didn't even think it was possible for me to even get on an airplane. I thought that if I went to go buy a ticket for airplane, someone's going to tell me to get off. Like, that's how my mindset was. So like, none of that was possible to me. So when I started skipping school and my grades dropped, I was no longer eligible for sports. I was like, well, I'm going to drop out of high school now. Like, I, like if I can't play sports, I'm not going to go to school. And if I'm hungry all the time, I'm just going to go get a job. So, you know, I dropped out my sophomore year because my grades were already so bad and I wasn't ineligible to play sports and there goes my future. So when I dropped out of school, I was living with my dad in Tallahassee and he tried to get me to go back to school. He enrolled me back into the high school, but the high school was so bad that like, so I, I skipped every day. And then finally one day he caught me. He was like, how many days have you skipped? I was like, I went to school one day and that's the day you enrolled me. That was like four months ago and I haven't been back since. And he was like, that's crazy. They would have told me. I'm like, the school is terrible. They don't even know I'm not there. So he was like, you know, I don't want you out here on the streets. I don't want you selling drugs. I don't want you getting in trouble. I don't want you following footsteps of, you know, anyone else. So I was like, okay, I'll figure something out. So I remember I started washing cars with like dish soap and like messing up people's paint jobs. I didn't know that messed people's paint jobs up back then, but mm -hmm. I was doing that. And around that time, my dad was moving out of Florida. We're moving back to Atlanta to live with his sister, my aunt. Uh, her children are my age, my cousins. Um, and and I was just like, well, I'll just go back to school. 
school, I guess. So that's when I went back to high school with my cousin. And I was in ninth grade again with my younger brother when I should have been in 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty, pretty embarrassing. Um, but my junior year, I forgot why I skipped school again. I wasn't skipping school crazy this time. I think it was maybe for like a video game like Halo or something like that. And some recruiter came to my house, some Navy recruiter looking for someone else that used to live in the house. And I was like, oh, no, they don't live here anymore. And I like, I shut the door. And then he came back and he was like, what are you doing? How old are you? I was like, I, you know, I'm 17, 18. I'm sitting at home playing video games. He's like, why are you not in school? I was like, oh, Halo came out, you know, playing Halo. And he was like, you know, can I come in and play Halo with you? And I was like, okay, come on in, man. And he came in. He had his uniform on and everything. So I was like, yeah, come on in if you want to play. We played Halo for a little bit. And then, you know, he asked what I was doing. And I was like, I wanted to be a biochemist. So I was like, yeah, I'll go to community college and I'll do the two year transfer after that. And, you know, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And he was like, well, have you ever thought about joining the military? And I was like, no. And then he was like, well, here's what can happen if you do that. And then he kind of told me, and I was like, oh, this sounds cool. I'll do it. The next week, I signed enlistment papers. I did the exam. And then I just had to wait one more year to graduate to get shipped off. So my whole senior year, I already knew what was happening to me. Like everyone, was doing SATs and ACTs, I was like, I'm going to the military, you know, the day after we graduate. So, you know, my life is made up. After I graduated high school, I literally got shipped off to boot camp in Chicago the very next day. And that was a crazy experience to be in the same room with 30 other guys for the next eight weeks. And like just watching them have like these psychological breakdowns of not being by their families and, and being deprived of all these different things and, and having to swallow their pride to listen to someone. That was strange because like I didn't have any of those problems. I didn't have any trouble listening to someone telling me what to do. I love the fact that we had clean clothes and we got the shower and we ate three meals a day. I had a bed. Like, I was like, what are y'all tripping about? Like, this is amazing. So like, that was an experience. And then after boot camp, I got shipped off to Pensacola, Florida for my school to learn how to fix helicopters. So I was there for another eight weeks. What's crazy is that like, I finished the top of my class and I got to pick where I wanted to go. And initially I was like, I want to stay locally near my family. So I can help support my family. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And the closest base was Jacksonville, Florida. So I was like, cool, I pick Jacksonville. So it was like, all right, cool. Moss is going to Jacksonville. And then when I got the orders printed out, it was like, you're going to San Diego. And I was like, I thought I was going to Jacksonville. You let me pick. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. That squadron used to be in Jacksonville, but now they're relocated to San Diego like three years ago. I'm like, wow. how is your information three years old? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't understand how did this happen? And, and I was like, can we just fix this? It's like, no, once it's printed, it's done. So I was actually really like upset upset and scared that I was moving all the way to San Diego and I wasn't gonna be able to support my family. So I was worried, but you know, I drove all the way out there, it took like three days to drive. I think that was the first time I had like an emotional breakdown because I've never seen the world before. You know, like I've never seen anything west of like New Orleans. You know, I've never seen a desert, a cactus, like that looks so weird to me. A blizzard, I've never been in a blizzard before. That was crazy. I've never seen mountains. Like I remember just seeing like a mountain out in the distance one time and like I had to stop and pull over I just sat there for an hour and just looked at the mountain it was just the craziest thing and then when I got to San Diego oh, I just remember just like crying so bad like it just felt like I like arrived on a different planet I just wish that everyone that I grew up with could see this moment like and experience this with me and I just couldn't believe that I was like living this life right now and you know I didn't even do anything I just arrived in San Diego I was just so grateful Thanks Career Karma for sponsoring this video. If you made a goal this year to break into tech, don't waste time and get started now. Check out Career Karma and get matched to top tech boot camps to start your journey into tech. Career Karma is an online community with all the resources you'll need to break into tech in 2022. There you'll find unbiased and detailed reviews of all top boot camps by former boot camp students, live audio rooms with boot camp students, grads, and tech industry experts, free prep courses from top boot camps, boot camp matching based on your learning preferences. You'll also find a free mini boot camp from Scott Moss there as well. Career Karma is free and always will be, so click the link in the description box to sign up and start looking at boot camps. The first thousand of my subscribers to sign up and get matched to boot camps will get a free coaching session package to make sure you start 2021 on the right foot. So you're based in San Diego and you're working with aircrafts, how was that experience? Cause you did that for the next four years, right? Yeah, yeah. So my first duty station was at a training command where they trained new pilots. I was like working on these bleeding edge helicopters, helping pilots train other pilots. And I did that for two and a half years. And so I did that and I actually did pretty well. I was doing so well that people were recommending this program where you can kind of like put your Navy career on pause, go to school for four years, become an officer, and then come back in the Navy as a commissioned officer. So people were recommending that I do that because I 
I was talking about how much I want to be a pilot. I was like, I want to be a pilot. I want to fly these things. Once I started spending time away from my command and away from the people that I work with and just like hanging out in San Diego, I realized that like, oh, I only want to be a pilot because I'm in the Navy. But like, if I wasn't in the Navy, what would I want to do? And that's when I was like, I don't want to be a pilot anymore. The world is so much bigger than the Navy. That's actually when I started experimenting with software engineering. I used to ride a motorcycle exclusively and I wanted like a helmet, like this high tech Iron Man like helmet. And like, I couldn't find one. So I was like, I'm going to make one. And I was like, yeah, I could fix helicopters. I could figure this out. And eventually I did. I prototyped this helmet that had like a welder's mask on the visor. So it would like go dark when it detected light. It had like a little LCD screen on the front of it that had a camera on the back so I can see what's behind me. I had like all this crazy stuff that I just like hacked together with like no knowledge, just like Googling things and like buying books from Barnes and Noble. And I was like, this is really cool. Like, is this a job? And you know, I started looking into things and found out that like people get paid to do this. And I was like, I want to do that. How was leaving the military to kind of do this new thing that you found out that you really liked? So typically you do a four year enlistment. I did a five year enlistment. Two years into it, I got put into another command. This command was actually sea deployable. So we were going to go out to a boat, but not yet because it was a brand new command. So they had to staff up. Year four, they're about ready to go out to sea. So now and I've ranked up. I'm at the point now where I'm like a supervisor. So I'm in like charge of people and stuff. And you have to go do a physical. And and at this point, I'm like in the best physical shape of my entire life. So like everyone knows I'm about to pass this physical. It's not that big of a deal. You just got to go get it. I go do this physical and the doctor like you've had this condition called rhabdomyolysis, which is basically like extreme dehydration. Like a lot of people who work out a lot and don't drink water, they have this once or twice their whole life. So the doctor was like, oh, if you get this once, typically we discharge you, but you're super healthy. So, you know, I trust you. And if you say you want to get out, I'll medically discharge you. If you don't say you want to get out, I'll trust that you'll take care of yourself. And I was like, look, dude, I wasn't going to re-enlist in a year anyway when my contract's up. So yeah, go ahead and uh, process me out. I was going through a divorce actually with the mother of my first child and I haven't seen him for like months. And it was like really depressing. He was on a whole other side of the world. He was in Florida. I was in San Diego, obviously. And that was really getting to me. So there was like a lot of motivation to just like hit the ground running and get my life together so I can get back in my son's life and figure that out. So going back to school just wasn't an option. I was like, I'm not gonna go spend another four years in college after I just spent four years in the Navy. Like this yeah. just, I don't care if they are paying for it. I'm not doing it. I was like, okay, I want a life that doesn't have a ceiling. I wanna make good money. I wanna have fun and I need it to happen fast. And just doing a lot of searching, it always led me to software engineering. It was just like working as an engineer at a tech company. I was like, okay, if this is what I gotta do, this is what I'm gonna do. So naturally that led me to, how do you become a software engineer fast? Like, what's the fast way to become an engineer? What's the fast way to learn to code? And then these things called boot camps kept popping up. And I was just like, all right, this sounds cool. So I applied to one boot camp. I mean, at this point in 2012, there was only like two boot camps ever. I can't remember the name of the first one. I think they're like, they're sold off now. But I interviewed there. And it's after I studied. They were doing Ruby. So I like, I studied all this Ruby. I spent all this time learning this stuff. I did Rails the hard way. I rebuilt Twitter from scratch with Ruby on Rails. I felt so ready. I did this interview and the guy gets on. He's like, all right, imagine if you have a dice on your desk and i was like oh my god what, what does this have to do with anything about ruby or any, and then like they emailed me i was like no you're not getting in so i was like okay that's cool and instead of getting discouraged i was just like what's the next one i found this other one called hack reactor and they did javascript and i did the same thing i studied my ass off i applied i did the interview i passed the first interview i did the second interview i passed the second interview and then for the third interview me and my brother were like yo let's drive up to san francisco and let's do it in person because like i I don't want to mess this one up. I think my best chance is if I'm there. If they see me and they feel my energy mm -hmm. and they see what I'm about, I, I think they'll let me in. We drove up there, literally no money, and did this interview. One of the founder, no, not a founder, actually a good friend of mine, Tim, he did the interview. And then we drove back home later that day. And then following week, they sent me an email saying, no. Sorry, oh, wow. you didn't get in, uh, but you can try again in like, I think it was like three months or something like that. And I was just like, thanks, but I don't have three months. You know, I'm going to be getting out of the Navy soon. I don't know what day yet, but I'm going to be getting out and I have to do this. I was like, let me do it next week. And they were like, oh, okay. Typically we don't let people do it in a week, but like, we really liked you. You had everything going for you. You just couldn't pass the technical. So we'll let you do it. But if you fail, you can't try again for a year. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So then I took time off. I locked myself in my room for 30 days. I studied all the stuff that I got wrong on that interview plus more and then I did the interview this time it was with one of the founders which is a good friend of mine now and I crushed it I totally destroyed that interview to the point where we finished early he had nothing else to ask me and I was just like I know I killed that tell us how your your coding bootcamp experience was how was that experience 
Coding boot camp, terrible, terrible. Not not because the school was bad, because I was struggling really bad. And looking back, it was it was two things. One, I thought it was just me that was struggling, and everyone else was great. So it was a lot of imposter syndrome. But the other part was that like I wasn't okay with not knowing something. And I was like, I'm gonna quit. I don't I don't want to do this. This is tough. This is not for me. I'm 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 gonna figure something else out. And one of the engineers there, she talked to me. She pulled me aside and was like, You should go talk to everyone else. In your class and ask them how they feel before you quit. And that's what I did. I asked everyone and they all were like, yo, this is terrible. I am struggling. And they were like, I thought you you were doing pretty good. We were like copying you. I was like, what? Me? No, <laughs> man. Like, do not copy me. You were doing your boot camp. You were learning a lot. You were enjoying it. So how was like the end of the boot camp and like searching for jobs? Actually, before I got done with the boot camp, the staff approached me and they were like, do you want to stay on as like a technical mentor type person for the next, you know, cohort? You think you'd be good at it? And I was like, all right, you know, it pays. Let's do it. I think that's the, one of the best things that ever happened to me because at the time I was doing all the interviews for every incoming potential student. So before I ever interviewed for any job in my entire life, I had already conducted hundreds of interviews for students trying to get into a boot camp. So I learned a lot about the psychology behind interviews. What does a good interview look like? What does a bad interview look like? Like I didn't know it at the time that I was learning that much, but when I started looking for jobs, I think the first interview I ever did was at Uber. Although they asked me questions I did not know the answer to, like they asked me had finding algorithms. They asked me to like write algorithms to like determine how many times it's going to take to weigh marbles and like all oh, a bunch of crazy stuff that I just did not know, like on mm -hmm. a whiteboard. They still made me an offer. Like I still got an offer because I knew what to say that was going to be valuable in their eyes, even though I didn't know the answer to this question. I wrote this tight line between like showing them enough that, hey, if I had more time, I could totally figure this out because based off these questions that I'm asking and, and my behavior and my mindset and how motivated I still am. But what also, you know, not trying to admit that I have no idea what I'm doing. Do you have like tips for people who are interviewing? Just general tips. Like you said that you're able to like have that fine line against like showing the interviewer that you know you can know more if you had more time you don't know this when you're doing your first job but like people who are interviewing they're just people these people have nothing to lose right they already have a job they're already getting paid maybe they don't want to be there but they literally have nothing to lose so most of their mindsets or their state of being is, is usually you know someone who has nothing to lose typically those people don't want someone like ruining their vibe so like if you come in there and you're like very uptight and stressed and like on the edge they're not gonna like it because they're in the opposite mind state they're just like you know whatever let's just do this this is so chill i don't care that's gonna happen to me so like if you kind of meet them there psychologically you kind of actually play into the bias which is the problem of the interviewing industry is that there's tons of bias unfortunately because we're humans but you, you play into that bias and you come off as someone that's also relaxed and chill and doesn't crack under pressure and you know doesn't really care about this either and it's just like you know someone that's like that is clearly someone who's like very sought after and very talented so like you already just win just by having Having that right personality and that right energy coming without even saying a word that's one tip something that i did when i was trying to do acting was i would like sit in front of a mirror and like get so extreme about all the lines that i was practicing to the point where like you would never do this on camera but if i can do this at this most extreme level then when i have to tame it in on camera it, it won't feel that weird or awkward to the point where like you're so nonchalant that you just almost don't care about it like something you would never do in an interview but like yeah. to the point where it almost seems comical and then when you actually get in an interview you, you'll tone it back some and you'll still come off as someone that's very calm and not panicky and, and in a very relaxed mind state. And that actually helps a lot, especially for like entry level positions where pretty much everyone's panicking and like, yeah. it's like freaking the hell out. The other one is that like every question is an opportunity to brag about yourself. That's it. Like people don't understand that like these interviews are not like a test where it's like, here's a test. It's either yes or no. You're going to get them right or you're going to get them wrong or we're going to give you a job. It's not how it works. If that was the case, they would just give you a test and then you would take it and you would get the job or not. It's in person for a reason because they want to experience you. So you just trying to get the question right, you didn't give them yourself. So you have to be showing off. Every question is designed some way, somehow to get you to talk about something that's going to make you look good. And you need to be figuring that out. So like, you know, if I ask you a question about like, hey, I got some of the stuff on the screen. Here's a, here's a function. Something inside of here is broken. Find it and fix it. Okay. Before you start diving in and trying to answer that question, maybe you should talk about how this reminds you of a time, you know, on a project you were working on where you got stuck on a bug and how you solved it and stuff like that. And then maybe you'll try to answer the question because now you just told me how much experience you have about getting stuck in problems and that you know how this works and you've done it before and you used to be naive, but now you're better. 
her, that to me is so much more valuable than you just answering the question. Now I know, right? Because now even if you get the question kind of wrong, I might just be like, I knew what you meant to say, you know, like, you know, I'm, I might just like, oh, you just, you're nervous or something like that. I might just think it's me. Maybe I asked the question wrong because that story you gave me clearly tells me that you know what the hell is going on. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you got it kind of wrong right now, I'm just going to chalk it up to nerves. And I'm not going to count that against you. Things like that. So you really need to be showing off at every opportunity you can, even if it feels like they're not asking you because they're never going to ask you directly. Hey, tell me something amazing about yourself. <laughs> like mm -hmm. they're never, never going to ask yeah. you that. For a lot of people, it's very uncomfortable to brag about themselves. You probably feel gross after you do it, but you have to, you have to sell yourself. And then I would say the last tip is how to avoid being blocked or stuck. You know, like when you get to that point where they ask you a question and you legit blank and you have no idea what to say and you just don't know what to do next. Typically what I do in that, and I actually literally done this in an interview before, a Fang interview before. I got stuck and I was just straight up candid with them. I was just like, I've never been asked this question before. This is super difficult. So if this is the type of work we're doing here. A, I'm excited that I'm going to be working on this with you all. And B, I can't imagine what it's going to take for me to learn this. But like, just like anything else that I learned at this point, it's only a matter of time. And I just kind of talk about it like that. Like, I'm definitely not going to be able to answer this question. I'm drawing a blank here. But this does remind me of something that I've done in the past that looks like this. So I'm going to talk about that. Is that fine if I talk about that? And sometimes I'm like, yeah, 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 we'll talk about that. Or they might just like, no, just try, try your best. Answer the question. And then I'm like, okay, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely try my best here. And then at that point, I'm just going to bullshit them. I'm just going to be like, okay, cool. Can you repeat the question? And I'm just going to try to waste time at the same time bragging about myself as much as I can to help cover up the fact that I have no idea what the hell is going on, even though I was candid about it. Oh, don't bullshit them. Like you can't make up something and pretend that it's true. Just be candid. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't really know that. I, I grinded on this other thing. I was studying for this other thing. I didn't know we was doing that. That's cool though. Like, you know, if, if we had two days, this would be done. No problem. I'm going to use you. I'm going to ask you a bunch of good questions. And you're going to guide me through. How does that sound right and like you gotta like have that vibe about it that mindset about it to where like you're not gonna let this question get you down you're not gonna close down and not say anything I worked at Hack Rector after I actually became an official engineer for a little over a year I forgot why I left I think it just I just felt like it was time to go um at, at that point I had I had built Hack Rector remote which is like their only boot camp option now like I made that oh, that was wow. a beta thing I felt really accomplished with that so I was like yeah I think it's a good time to leave I want to go try something else you actually built two like six successful startups, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so impressive, like, especially like you're talking from about your background. So like, can you talk about like, why did you decide to go from like Udacity to building your first company? What inspired you to decide, okay, I'm going to just build my own thing? I never really sat down and was like, I want to build my own thing. Again, I'm an opportunistic person. And I think it was the first conference that I spoke at. I forgot what conference it was, but I gave a talk at a conference. And after the conference, I had engineering managers from like Visa, Bloomberg, like come up to me and were like, can you come and teach our engineers this? Or can you come consult with us? And I was just like, uh, uh mm. I don't know. You know, in my head, I'm like, I'm not good enough. So I didn't really entertain it because imposter syndrome again, they kept you know, emailing me. They're like, no, seriously, can you come out and like teach us? And I'm like, yo, they are so serious about this. So I hit up my friend who, who was that CTO and I was like, yo, we got to go do this stuff at Bloomberg or Visa. I need your help. And he was like, this is crazy. So in order to work with these companies, you, you needed a company. So we had to start a company to go work with these companies. So that's why we started the first company, Angular Class, because we were literally teaching Angular to these big companies. That's what they paid us to do. With Angular Class, I know you also built a second multi-million dollar startup too, which is TIP. Am I saying that right? Or TYPE? How do you... It's, it's TYPE. TYPE. Yeah, we couldn't okay. afford the T-Y. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So can you, can you also, did you build both things simultaneously? Like was Angular class going on and then you decided to also include type two? Yeah. So the consultant business was, well, Angular class was cool, but it, it was, it was a crazy lifestyle. Mm. I was literally on a jet every week flying to some city some state out of the country. It was just crazy. I wasn't even writing code anymore. I was just like negotiating deals and traveling all the time. And I didn't like that. Like I'm a family guy. I think mentally I was becoming ill. Like I think I started developing like bipolar, which is like a, a real thing. If you like, ch I didn't know this, but if you change time zones, like from East coast to West coast frequently, you can actually develop bipolar because your sleep patterns get disrupted and you, you just start to have like different personalities for different time zones. Like I didn't recognize myself in the mirror. It was like wow. the craziest feeling. And I was just like, like, I don't like this. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really don't like this. So I gave up on the consultancy business. I told all my employees and stuff. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Business is good. I got to figure something else out. So y'all can keep this. Y'all can have this. Um, you don't even have to buy me out. I'm just out. 
I don't wow. want to do this anymore. YC is like a really, like, I, I don't know if the audience knows this, but YC is like a huge deal. Can you talk more about how it was like being there and like doing that experience? YC is, I can't even believe that I was even part of that opportunity. It's kind of crazy just saying that, but you are literally bumping shoulders with like Silicon Valley elites, some of the best investors and entrepreneurs in the world. You know, like the, the CEO of YC is Michael Seibel, who's one of the co-founders of Twitch. Uh, right. So like, you're, and you talk with him all the time and like, he's the one who reviewed our application and I'm emailing him and and things like that. It's just, it's just crazy to think about that. Like those are the people you're interacting with. The companies that were in my batch in the winter 18, some of them are worth like billion dollar companies now. Like they're doing so well. So like you never really know where you're gonna be interacting with, but it was a very surreal experience. We also all had imposter syndrome, but just like when I was in Hack Rector, everyone thought the opposite. They were like, actually Scott, like we feel like you got a lot of advice. So like I was actually the one helping out a lot of the people in my cohort, giving them advice on how to talk to investors and how to hire engineers and how to build a product, how to talk to these big companies and I was like I guess I know more than I thought and maybe I do belong more than I think I did and maybe I have more to offer than I assume then COVID happened and uh, I think I just took the last bit of energy we had mm -hmm. left in our tank again we missed a lot of crucial deadlines partnerships that we had lined up with like potential companies that would have like really helped us and missing those deadlines just really hurt us so we decided that you know it's probably best just to call it like it is now um, we had a couple opportunities to do like a m a emerge and acquire but that would have meant me and my brother and my co-founder like going to go work at some company that we don't want to work at we thought it was best just to shut down doors um and i just helped all my employees get jobs so i spent like a week helping them get jobs some of them got hired at like coinbase and, and other companies like that so, and then in the meantime i went and got a job at netflix because of netflix's culture and the way that they operate it didn't feel much different i mean if you go read netflix's culture doc you're basically your own ceo <laughs> you know like you you kind of do whatever you want and they just expect you to be responsible and make good decisions and be able to back up your decisions and no one's really going to question you and you know that's the reality of it so uh, that's actually why i chose netflix because i was worried that I, I wouldn't be able to go be a cog in a wheel somewhere and be able to just go back to being you know an engineer on some team i was like i don't know if i can do that you know I, i've been a product manager a designer a cto a ceo a salesperson, a marketing person for the last three to five years, I don't know if I can just go back to writing code from like a task and a Trello board. Like, I just don't know if I can do that. Netflix made it easy. They were just like, yeah, you can, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want, however you want to be impactful. And I was like, oh, this is legit. So, you know, that's why I chose that company. And I love every bit of my time at Netflix. Now you're working at Initialize, which I think Gar is Gary Tan. Like, yeah, Gary, Gary Tan, Tan is the manager partner there. Yeah. yeah Alexis Ohania. Like, this is like a huge deal yep. VC firm. So, like, how you went from Netflix to working for VC? It's so serendipitous, like how like a lot of this stuff happens. I was on paternity leave at Netflix. I just, I had my daughter and uh, Netflix has a year of paternity leave. So I was literally taking a year off of paternity leave, like, which is amazing if you think about it. Cause I didn't have a baby, you know, it didn't come out of my body. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a dad, but yeah, super thankful for that. And I had every intention on going back to work at Netflix because honestly, it's one of the best companies I've ever worked at. If I ever have to be an engineer somewhere else, it'll probably be the only company I would ever work at. It's legit that good. I was working with this company called Career Karma, which is a YC company. The CEO, Ruben, is a good friend of mine. And one of the other co-founders was actually like one of my students at Hacker Actor. So like like all these like random moments coming together. They recruited me to help like shoot this mini bootcamp course on Career Karma to like help people who've never programmed to get into it. So you know, I was doing that, helping them. And around that time, I was like, I'm going to get into like angel investing. I'm going to use some of this disposable income I, I've earned and, and like start investing in startups here and there, YC startups and things like that. And then I realized I was like, I don't know anything about investing in companies. So I need to learn more about that. So I started looking into that. And that's when me and Ruben started talking. And he was like, oh, you know, initialize is like looking for roles and this and that. And I was just like, oh, that sounds cool. I never really thought about being a VC, but you know, I kind of like where I'm at Netflix. And then and I've known Gary from YC because he used to be a partner at YC. So like I've talked with him before and, and things like that. And then Ruben started talking with Gary in their board meetings about like me helping them with this mini bootcamp course. And Gary thought that was impressive and, and things like that. So a lot of that stuff was happening in the background where we were like all kind of talking about each other, but like indirectly, Gary had made a video about, you know, how VCs make money, how most people can be VCs and that they're hiring to be a VC. And like, I was watching that video like three o'clock in the morning, which was so weird because I'm usually not up at three o'clock watching YouTube videos. So it was just so weird I that am. I was watching that video. <laughs> like, that's not weird. <laughs> I watched the video and then I kind of felt like Gary was talking to me through the screen, like you should apply. Like I really legit felt like he was talking to me directly. So I was like, I'm going to apply. And I did. And you know, eight interviews later, they made me an offer. And it was the hardest decision I ever had to make. Leave this amazing company that I'm on paternity leave on that is 
been so amazing, you know, to go do VC or not. And, you know, I decided to do it. That's where I'm at now. With all the success you've had, like what's kept you motivated? Because it seems like you've never like been like, okay, I'm happy being an engineer. I'm just going to stick with engineering. It seems like you're always trying to like move up and up and up. So what's, is there something that's keeping you motivated? I think there's a couple things that keep me motivated. One I'm always thinking of like the next generation of individuals that are coming after me. And I feel like I owe it to them to go as far as I possibly can until I can't anymore so that they can see an example of what that looks like. I have to keep going. So when someone else decides that this is what they want to do, they can look back and like, here's an example. You know, here's some things that happened right. Here's some things that happened wrong. And then they have an example because that's all I ever wanted was an example. Like as a black man and just black people in tech in general, there are so few of us like in engineering and in in VC, it's like like even less. So do you have any yeah. advice for black people in tech? We go through a unique yeah. experience in tech. Yeah, absolutely. Being black in tech is, yeah, I guess it's like being black anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one thing that I can say is that I haven't experienced enough friction in my path to where I felt like it would stop me or slow me down. There's definitely friction. Don't get me wrong. It's there, but not to the point where I'm just like, I can't do this. I'm, this isn't meant to be. I'm not supposed to be here. It never gotten to that point. Also, I think a lot of black people, sometimes you feel like you gotta like turn down your blackness or you gotta like bring it back some to like form and fit in. So like they'll accept you. But like, once I stopped doing that, I think I had way more opportunities. The other thing is that like right now, at least on paper and in the media, a lot of these companies are in the need for more black people in tech and you know, they say they're trying their best to find us and you know all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, there's huge opportunities out there for black people in tech or any minorities in tech in general, and they're not gonna come get you. These opportunities are not gonna come knock at your door like, hey, have you ever heard of being an engineer? Here you go, here's the three month you know salary. Like it just doesn't work like that. Like you have to go get it still. Don't be afraid to be yourself, but at the same time realize that you're definitely gonna have to change. That doesn't mean conforming to being someone you're not. It just means learning new things that you currently don't know and realizing after you learn those things, the things that you want now will probably not be the things that you want after you learn these things. Uh, And Mm -hmm. I can say that for sure. So be okay with learning new things. Realize that no one is in your way. I can promise you no one is trying to stop you from doing anything. And as few examples as there are of us out here, there are some examples and reach out to those individuals, make contact uh, because I promise you, if this is something that you want to do, no one's going to stop you. The last thing I want to say for anyone that's listening is everything that you probably want to do sounds crazy and it probably is compared to what you might be doing now but that just means you have to be crazy right like there's really only two types of people there's people that are like you know practical practical people they do practical things they do things that make sense and then you have the impractical people the people that are they just seem wild the only time we have progress the only time we have true innovation is when some impractical crazy person decides to do something so you actually have to be crazy in order to make progress. You have to be. There's no other way. Otherwise, you'd be practical and you would never do anything that sounded like you know crazy or didn't make sense. So it's okay to think crazy and to be crazy and do crazy things because that's the only way to actually make progress. 